Okay, Dan Ng is moderating. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to have you um, put a little bit of information into the chat. There's a lot of people on the call, so we thought that might be the most efficient way to do it. And I'm just going to put that in the chat now. So the thing is, we'd like you to kind of uh, tell us whether you've read the book, heard about it, or you can go the other way and tell us about your interest in, in uh, systems uh, thinking. And so put that in the chat. I'll give everybody a minute or two, actually 15 seconds to do that. Everybody have access to the chat? Oh, good. While well, people are doing that chat thing, um, just a quick rundown of the agenda today. We're going to um, have David do a quick outline of the book. And then following that, we're gonna walk through each of the sections. So mm -hmm. I guess there's five sections in total, including the introduction. And as David indicated earlier, we're going to, um, as you, as you uh, get the information on each of the sections or parts, um, we'll, pause for a minute, give people a chance to ask questions or reflect or whatever else. Okay, sound like a plan? And it's, uh, I guess my, one of the activities I'll be doing is um, asking you to put your, um, your questions or you're raising your hand whichever way you prefer, and then we'll try to uh, get that in sequence so you, everybody gets a chance to ask their questions. It's all good? All right, go for it, David. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. So there's three of us uh, featured and, um, we're, and we're gonna welcome other people in the conversation. Um, so I'm going to uh, actually step through the book. So uh, I have um, a wiki and I have given you the wiki uh, link actually in the original invitation. And now I populated it out. So uh, those of you who want to follow along can, uh, can do that. Uh, there's a lot of content in it. I've done excerpts. Uh, so I knew it was all about. Um, and then uh, David Hawk, uh, who was a student at uh, in the Social System Science program, I discovered that Fred Emery actually gave him the book, uh, is going to be uh, commenting on what he thinks about it. And then Johnny Pornahad, who is also in the program, uh, is going to comment. And then we'll give everyone the opportunity to um, ask <laughs> questions, make their own comments uh, and prod. Um, the, the, the essence, so the reason for this session uh, was actually because uh, periodically I do excerpts of, uh, of uh, chapters or, or books that I, and, and I'd done a, uh, an excerpt of introduction for this book, but I actually hadn't um, read the whole book. Uh, but uh, it was getting a lot of action on uh, LinkedIn. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess people are interested. So maybe we should have a session about it. 
So let me share the screen. And um, on the wiki, um, this is where we start off. Um, and Robert Best is, uh, is on this call. He's the one that actually supports us with the Open Learning Commons with this federated wiki. Um, we have the content. And so um, you can click on these links just like a normal wiki. These things kind of go left and right. Um, but uh, I'm going to start here and talk about here. So here's the outline of the book. Uh, came out in 1969. There's an introduction. There's two chapters associated with the precedence to systems theory. There is one, two, three, four, five, six chapters on properties of open systems. Four chapters on the environment of a system. Part four, human organizations of systems. This is when I started getting tired of doing transcripts. And the last section is actually on um, systems management. Now, just let me back up a little bit here. Uh, when I was looking at this, there are multiple editions of this book. And so it gets confusing which, time, which ones you're looking at. Uh, the original 1969 version got reprinted multiple times. And then in the 1981 version of this book, they revised it and uh, changed the chapters, as a matter of fact. And then they added a second volume. Um, so let me start off with the introduction. OK. So in the selection of introduction, uh, selection of papers for the volume, two problems have arisen, namely, what constitutes systems thinking and what system thinking is relevant to thinking required for organization management? So this is really a management book, um, and it's very, very focused towards that. Now, we're thinking about management in 1969, which is quite a long time ago, and we're reading articles back into the 1940s. And so uh, give that as your frame for where we are. And so the question about what we've forgotten is really here. The question as to what we might have learned since that time is, uh, is kind of open. But let's go through here. Uh, first problem is obviously critical. Um, and so saying, okay, well, okay. So the, he's trying to figure out just what system thinking is. Now he says, there's two arguments for a systems approach to the analysis of living phenomenon. Now it's interesting that they're using this idea of living phenomenon as a system, because when you talk about systems, um, my background is actually information systems. When uh, I started working, looking at system thinking in the first place, which is living or non-living and depending on how you want to define it. Um, there's this idea about theorizing about biological systems and how you would use them in social systems. But the general idea is to do it in social systems. Okay, first, this argument of Gestalt and properties. Uh, Gestalt uh, was something, and maybe I'll get uh, David or Johnny to help me with that a little bit later. Uh, Gestalt was um, an idea of wholeness that comes. Um, mm -hmm. It comes from the German philosophy. Um, and then the argument that consultant is, the, the consultant properties are common to different types of systems. Um, and so here's where you get into the general systems idea that there it's not just uh, biological systems we're looking at, but you can take some of those learnings and use them in social systems. Okay. Um, now, what do we want to do with this? Analysis of part systems in cause effect terms. And so we are talking about social systems. Uh, human beings have will. And so therefore, uh, we should have cause and effect. And we can discuss that. Um, and analysis of the total system, like to reveal those properties uh, and have allowed us to, uh, the species to adapt and to survive in typical environment. So go on with this. Uh, second question, what systems thinking is relevant for organization management? We focused on this. And it says that it has to be analyzed as open systems. Now this is saying open systems is actually an interesting uh, precursor for work that comes uh, even today uh, because uh, the term that uh, Fred mm -hmm. and his second wife, Marilyn use is open systems theory. That's not all of systems theory, but that is their branch of it. Um, and so seeing it open system in 969 kind of heads the direction. Let's see. Human systems here, great video work has been done. Okay, so central, our central purpose has been open systems, not closed systems. Okay, now 
they, uh, the interesting thing that I've gone through these readings is that they've given us these readings, but they actually are not necessarily in order of favor. What I'm actually finding, if you actually read through the readings, is that some of them are they're sequenced um, chronologically. So the Angle paper is actually the first paper. Um, but what he says is the major impact came from bon Bonberta Lanfey, uh, and uh, that is that is general systems theory. Now, uh, it's interesting, interesting here that he writes about general systems theory and the idea about using uh, a theory that works across living and mechanical systems. But he says that um, it, within the systems engineering community, they haven't actually made that progress. And that's in 1969. So that kind of covers the first couple of sections of the book. In paper, th in section three, he says he'll deal with the properties of environment. So he, he, he go back to here. So we, we, did, we did precedent system theory. We'll come back to that. The properties of open systems. Uh, the third part is the environment of the system, which we'll deal with here. Um, and he talks about Sommerhoff. Now, I just actually was working on uh, extracting Sommerhoff. It's really a long paper. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I was also interested to see that he mentions J.J. Uh, Gibson, who is someone that I've been using um, with work on affordances, but it's not part of this. But it was research that was being done around uh, that time. And part four brings together papers have to do with social science. And so he now talks about um, the primary task of management is to manage the boundary conditions of the enterprise, um, work on goals and purposes of an enterprise. Okay. An enterprise can achieve a steady state. Okay, this idea of steady state um, I have to say that um, on the system changes learning circle, we're kind of working against that these days because we're thinking about processes. And so uh, I'll be interested to see what uh, the commentary is on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, go through this proposition. Uh, let's see. The task of management. This is leaders governed by the need to match constantly the actual potential capabilities of the enterprise to actual potential requirements of the environment. And this gets down to in uh, socio-technical systems theory. Um, more about steady state. Um, and so this idea of steady state, one of the things that comes out is what he calls equifinality, uh, which is there's multiple ways to get to the same place. Um, and that shows up in the readings later. Um, let's see, what else we got here? Um, the idea of autonomy and selective interdependence. And so this goes into the organization development of the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, principal draw on system theory for management theory, selected readings, um, papers in this order. Okay. So this is just explaining. Okay. So I'm with that. I'm going to actually just take a break here at this level. And um, I'm going to ask uh, David and then Johnny to uh, share a little bit about um, their experience with the book, um, what, what you thought of it, how maybe it might be helpful, uh, David, if you would also talk to us about um, how you got into the S cube program and, um, and uh, a little bit about the program itself. Uh, sure, sure. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. That my... Uh... Ah, uh, my throat is a, a bit of a problem, which is following my neck pain and head pain and all that. But I, I, I may have to take a slug of water every now and then if there's no vodka and handy. Uh, I, um, I guess both John and I were in that program. Uh, <clears throat> my lineage more or less began uh, because I was somewhat of a problem child and college. And so at Iowa State University, I arranged to, uh, um, in essence, take a class and go overseas. Because within the code of Iowa State, you were allowed to do that, although no one had ever done it. And they would even pay for the professors you found. And so I experimented with it by going to uh, Yucatan for a semester with about 20 students to study uh, 
uh, archaeology and related factors, which we found were fantastic. I mean, that event had one of the biggest impacts on my life of any event, meaning that we had read up on the Mayan Indians and their culture and why they did what they did, and then how they sort of ran out of steam and sort of went away. And during that trip, I found that was not exactly true. And in fact, everyone found out that it certainly wasn't true, that between the Mayan villages, they had these beautiful highways with uh, stones cast in place that mm. the poor people made for them, but they had no uh, buggies, no wheels, no carts. So there was no connection between their cities. Anyway, during the time that we were there working in uh, Chichen Itza, uh, they discovered a child's toy with wheels on it. And that destroyed my mind for the rest of my life because all the crap I had read from the Smithsonian in New York was simply crap. It was all based on the notion they didn't know wheels. They would have been great if they'd known wheels. And that I never quite recovered from. Next to that, <clears throat> the next semester I took a group and of course, after that, the university changed the rules. I took another group to Europe for a semester and we hired a very interesting person who was working on the Munich Olympic competition, uh, doing the architecture of what it might look like. And during that process, I became friends with him, hired him as our professor. Then when I graduated from Iowa State, went back to work with him. And I worked with him on the notion of architecture should not have parallel lines in it. That parallel lines is a funny Euclid thing, a mistake of Euclid, and we somehow should get over it because in essence, people are boxed up. They're in essence in jail cells. Anyway, uh, Hans Banish, the man I hired to be our professor who was head of the firm, liked that idea. And much of the design for the Munich Olympics was done to get rid of parallels. So this fantastic structure was done essentially without parallels in it. And anyway, he advised me to go off to uh, London and work for Westminster Council thereafter, which I did. That was the first time I was fired. I then got used to being fired at every job I ever had for the simple reason I didn't understand what they were doing. Anyway, in Westminster Council, I stopped a project to redo Piccadilly Circus. Uh, which they had hired me to make sure it got built. And in essence, I immediately started on how to destroy this stupid idea. Because that the idea to fit in with 1972, 73, they thought people should be underground walking and cars should be at the surface going as fast as possible. So to relieve congestion, you let cars go without stoplights as fast as they can. And humans should be underground out of their way. And so you can imagine the fun I had with that. Anyway, I got the project canceled, got fired. One of my consultants was an Edmund Bacon, which you may or may not know of. Uh, Edmund Bacon uh, was the person that in essence redesigned Philadelphia and made it a remarkable place. Also a professor at Penn. And so one day he told me that they are planning on firing me and he would like me to come to Pennsylvania. I could be his teaching assistant, which I did. So based on that, I became a student at University of Pennsylvania, took one semester of courses, and the faculty met and asked that I take no more courses in architecture. And so they agreed I could get my degree as long as I didn't take another architecture course. And they said I should go roam around campus and find things more in line with my interests. So the first person I ran into was Russell Acoff. So you can imagine. And then based on Acoff, I met many other people. So essentially all of my courses, except for one I took from uh, uh, whatever his name was, the geodesic dome guy, <clears throat> uh, what's his name? Anyway, I took one course from him in architecture, that was it. Then I went off to take ACOF courses, TRIS courses, and then courses in the communication center. And based on that, I ran out of courses because I took almost everything they offered. 
And then I did my thesis for planning, which they required. Architecture didn't, planning did. So I did a thesis in 1974 for architecture, which was uh, the communication alternative, how to get over concrete and start moving ideas. So it's sort of an anti-concrete city. Instead, how to go electronic and have electricity help us transfer ideas. And in essence, many people would never meet except electronically. Anyway, they failed me for it because they said there was too much humor in the thesis and there should be something serious. And lo and behold, when it was heard that I had flunked that, uh, Russell Acoff and Eric Trist went over to the planning faculty meeting and begged for them to give me a grade instead of an F because they wanted me in a venture they were going to do. And that in fact, my proposal for a communication-based city may well be realized in the future. And so in essence, they should get over their concrete cities. So they gave me an A. Uh, after the meeting, Eric and Russ asked me if I would join a new system science program they were going to create. And so they asked me if I could please be a part. And that's the reason they needed my F to be changed. Otherwise it's tough to qualify me in the next program. So I said, sure, as long as I don't have to apply, fill out forms or whatever, I'd be very happy. So I was happy. So I went in the program and that's where I met these people that we talk about a lot, uh, including Fred Emery, uh, Stafford Beer, um, on and on, it's, it's quite a nice list. And those people I worked with uh, for the next, well, next full year. And then near the end of that year, and this included using Emory's book in a course that I think Acoff, I think Russ was teaching the course and Emory came in every now and then to lecture in the course. And that's when he distributed his book, uh, the one we're looking at now. And uh, I quite liked much of the book at the time. Uh, I also liked arguing about much of the book but in essence, that was a course that I think was well worth taking. Uh, probably the thing I liked most in the book was the Angel stuff. I really liked Angel's ideas a lot and went, went off and read more of him. And what I really liked was Angel's idea that what happens when a system reaches its limits. Okay, just, just hold on to that for David because we're gonna come back. It. Yeah, because I, we're gonna, I'm going to come back to to Angle in a minute. So um, I'd like to switch over to Johnny and ask about how you joined the SQ program, Johnny. Yes, hi. Look, uh, I my education first. I uh, was born in Iran and I stayed there until the age of 18. I went to high school in Tehran. And then I left and went to England. And in England, I studied mechanical slash production engineer. And then I got, uh, which I got a scholarship from British Leyland. And then, you know, I went and worked for them for a couple of years. And then they offered me a very lucrative job in their plant in Tehran. You know, I was on the bus and truck division and they, we're making them over there, plus the double deck buses, you know, all that stuff. And uh, I guess I was at, you know, I worked for uh, Leyland for about a year. I couldn't take it anymore. It was truly an incredibly corrupt uh, system. So I joined another, actually, you know, was recruited to by, by another uh, manufacturing firm called Indus uh, General Industrial Corporation. They were making 11 different lines of household appliances. Now I worked there for a couple of years and we had as our consultants, Industrial Management Institute. I don't know whether uh, David knew, knew of this organization, but it was the most prestigious organization in that part of the world. It is still there. 
And the guy who was running the organization by the name of, and I'm going to say it in Persian, Jamshid Garachidori, who has one of the best selling books right now in systems thinking. I think it's now fourth edition. He was a systems thinker. He was a graduate of Berkeley. He had done you know, systems engineering or whatever. And basically, you know, unfortunately, I, I, I worked for them for almost five years. He recruited me. I worked for them for five years, but most of my projects were industrial, you know, projects. And then one day, one of my friends came to me and said that, you know, like, what are you doing in a couple of weeks time? I said that, you know, I'm going to be in such and such town because, you know, I'm working, say, for... Uh, national Iranian copper industries. He said, look, just stop, drop it. There's gonna be a course, I want you to participate. And guess what? Lo and behold, the course was given by Russell Akoff in Tehran. I knew a little bit about Akoff because in our second year in engineering, we had to um, study OR, and the book was authored by Akoff and Sassini, which by the way, the funny thing is this, that most of the books that I have from Russ, they were all autographed by him, not this one. So, you know, like a few years before his uh, passing away, I went to him and said, Russ, could you please sign this book for me? He looks at it, oh my God, where did you find this? I said, Russ, this was the book that we had to study for. So he wrote it to Johnny late, something like late, better than never, you know, something to that effect. But anyways, uh, took that course. It was one week course. And that truly changed my life. Of course, you know, the ideas of systems and properties of systems, all that stuff was, you know, not, not a big deal for me because of my background in engineering and all that stuff. So after the revolution in Iran, seven months after the revolution, I left and I came to the United States. This is 1979. And obviously, you know, I wanted to join his program, which I did at the work. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I kind of was a student of his for three or four years. And then I was fortunate that he, for some reason, which <laughs> I don't know why, he decided that he likes to involve me in most of the projects that he was doing. So as you know, David, for until 2009, when he passed away, I was continuously working with him in different kinds of, you know, organizations, projects, and so forth, including you're in Canada, right? I am. We've had several in very interesting projects in Canada, like Imperial Oil, you know, like uh, CP, you know, uh, CIBC, all very, very large uh, Canadian organizations. Now, when I was at the Bush, uh, at the, uh, what you call it, uh, SQ, we occupied the fourth floor of the Vance Hall. I'm sure that David remembers. Sure. And it was a, you know, bipolar, if that's the right expression, situation. Because on one end you had Trist, and on the other end you had Akoff. Now, obviously, you know, Eric Trist and Fred Emery, um, correct me if I'm wrong, they were both, what, psychologists? Out of Tavistock, that's where Akoff met them and invited them to, to join him. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, uh, and, and like David was saying, it was an incredible uh, program because we had every everybody would come and lecture. You know, uh, we had West Churchmen. The only person that we didn't have over there was Forrest there, which I later sat in his lectures in Iran because Jamshid had invited him. Russ wasn't very keen on systems dynamics. If if you remember, he wasn't very keen on you know creating models because you know he, he would say that only only things that you could you know i i believe in models when they are financial models anything else he would say that they're so complex that there's no way that you can model it and besides that if you really understand the whole thing why should you model so but you know we had everybody including you know, Fred Emery, who came and actually he became a visiting professor. I don't remember exactly what year that was. And then the, the, the way everything worked was that if you had a project at the Bush Center, which was the practice arm of SQ, you would have the right to invite any of the visiting professors or whatever to help you and work with. So I invited Fred in a couple of my, you know, projects. And, uh, you know, one thing that I found about him was, which was extremely different than, you know, Akoff, he, you know, Russ was kind of a bridge, and David helped me, uh, between uh, hard systems and soft systems. You know, every, everybody used to think that Akov didn't know mathematics, <laughs> actually, you know. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so that's how, you know, I, I got to work with... Uh, Emery, and that's how I ended up, you know, staying in the program, uh, and and also later working with Russ for, I guess, almost what, thirty years, different projects, different assignments, and so forth. And uh, I, I, um, you know, for 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 this. Uh, you know, uh, for the purpose of this session, you know, I kind of wanted to go back and say that what were the things that really, you know, impacted my thinking? And I learned from Emery. And you all already alluded to one of them, which was open systems theory. I think he was, and, you know, Tris and Dave again help me i don't know whether tris was part of that or not but definitely emery was the one who 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 basically gave to the world this concept of open systems theory which meant that you know especially organizations and so forth they get you know inputs from <clears throat> the outside and they you know the the, the whole story that, that was emery more than tris emery yes yeah. Anyway, yeah. and then the other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention, which you haven't said a word about it, <laughs> the, the book, you know, on purposeful systems. I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with, but on purposeful system is a collaboration between Akoff and uh, Emery. And, you know, whenever we had time and we wanted to go outside the book a little bit, I want to share with you some of the things that I believe came out of that work, which is tremendous. I mean, even today is tremendous. Okay. So, yeah, thanks, Johnny. So, sure. so I, so. Yes, I want I, on purposeful systems is going to come in, but I want to step back first. Um, and so I'm going to actually go back into screen share mode and I'm going to talk about um, the precedents to systems theory, the first section of the book. 
Um, and uh, and the reason for this is uh, is it's interesting um, what's in the book and what's missing in the book. So in the first section, and so this is a, a introduction to two chapters. And so it starts off with this discussion about Angle um, and recommends Angle highly. And then it has a second article, uh, which I actually am not finding that helpful, um, but it, it's a, it is a precursor. And he actually says that they like Sommerhoff. Sommerhoff actually references back to the, this Five Women and Friend article. Now, the part that got me was um, this quote, only pressing problems this race, uh, uh, preclude a selection from um, Stephen C. Pepper, 1950. It's actually not 1950. It's actually 1942. Um, and, uh, and he talks about contextualism as the root metaphor. So for those of you who in the, have been watching System Changes Learning Circle, we're focused on contextualism, but that's not actually what's in this book. This book in 1969 is much more focused on socio-technical systems theory. So I'm going to go into Angle a little bit, um, and then I'll jump over Feibelman uh, and Friend, and we'll go back and have David and Johnny talk some more about it. OK, so in this book, and you can actually get a copy of the whole book um, uh, on the Internet Archive. You can link to it here. I've taken some um, snippets out of it just so people get a feel for, for uh, what the book, what this, uh, this chapter is about. Um, and so um, Angel was a psychologist in 1941. This is early in psychology, so you're not talking about uh, about a very mature field at this point. This will try to find uh, the way around the world. Um, but the question is about the organism and personality. Um, the idea of structure of wholes is that if you actually think about a person, there could be multiple people inside you. Um, and so this is 1941, and the idea that in effect you would have a system and when we talk about systems, we end up talking about parts and holes. Well, then how do these holes interact with each other? Um, now, a, part of the problem he's saying is that the science we're dealing with um, actually creates these issues because we don't usually deal with holes really, really well. So uh, he, he makes a differentiation. He actually proposes to call this idea systems. And he makes a difference between relationships and systems. And uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, but in essence, 1941, this is the earliest one in the selection in the book. He talks about system and gestalt, uh, gestalt psychologists, again, the idea that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Uh, talks about what holes are uh, and that the significance. And so then this is actually the brief part. Um, so, um, that, that essentially it introduces the idea of parts and holes. And then people who are interested will actually dive back in and we'll have David talk a little bit more about Angle in a minute. Um, so the structure and function of organization, um, this one I found less helpful. It actually goes through uh, a lot of ideas about just um, the way that you look at systems. Um, the thing that they focus on is actually statics and dynamics. And so this is early in systems in 1969. And so one of the things I found is that there's a lot of questions around equilibrium and, uh, and uh, stable states and these sorts of things. And so uh, we uh, remember we're in the section here, precedence to, uh, to systems theory. Since so 1945, we're, we're a long way from 1969. And so first they're looking at statics and then looking at dynamics. So. When I took economics, it was like, okay, comparative statics, you do supply and demand, and then afterwards you figure out how things move. And so it's like, okay, this is kind of familiar the way they used to look at things. Um, try to look at, if you try to understand things when they're standing still, and then you go through and understand the relations. They talk about all these sorts of relations that you have. Then uh, I don't know why, it must be a style of writing. They have these rules of organization. Uh, structure is a sharing of subparts. Organization is one control of the structure. So they're doing definition work in this chapter, which I guess in 1945 is helpful for, for getting started. And then they go through dynamics. And it's like, OK, they have those changes. The elements of interaction. And you start seeing the ideas here, organization, environment, equilibrium, disequilibrium, all these sorts of things coming out. Um, they have some rules of interaction. 
to talk about the kinds of interactions, a little snippet here about uh, the stimulus from the environment, whether the stimulus, uh, because again, you're, you're looking at a, at a time when um, psychology is new. And so the idea of stimulus and response and these sort of things are, are big in systems. Um, the direction of structure and function, uh, relation statics and going through all that. And so the perfect organization. Now, I find this a funny, funny section to be writing about, but the, no, the, no perfect organization can exist. But their idea would be if you could study organizations, you could try to find something more ideal. Um, Self-determination, these sorts of things. So um, that's the first two chapters. I'm going to stop the share and invite David to comment. David. Uh, yes, <clears throat> uh, I, I agree with your comments about Ango's paper and most of it. Uh, there were other papers he wrote related to this, as well as someplace hidden in this paper, was his question, which uh, I enjoyed the most of all of his writing. And he raised the question of what happens to a system when it reaches its limits? And that was a question that really bedeviled me a lot. And uh, uh, Akoff was not very interested in that. And so I sort of went off and dealt with it myself. Trist turned out being interested in that. And so we spent some time on what does it mean for a system to reach its limits? And then what happens? Uh, probably it's the anarchism in my, my lungs or blood or whatever, but uh, I pointed out that I really agree with the proposal of Angle that when a system reaches its limits, and he stated this, the parts assume the whole. And then I tried to translate that into what it means when an organization reaches its limits or a human being reaches its limits, whatever. And so at the time I was quite intrigued by it, but I think no one else was. So I stopped talking about it and I just ignored the subject. Uh, now, relative to my uh, work in climate change, it's almost everywhere. It is the essence of what happens when these systems we've designed that will reach their limits, many already have. What happens then? And so I'm quite intrigued by Angel again in 2023, uh, probably more so than I was 40 years ago. And so I still hang on to that question of a system reaching its limits. And what does systems theory have to say about that? And I, I quite liked Angle raising that. And I quite liked uh, him attempting to give an answer, which he claimed he didn't understand, which I think was quite nice of him, but that was his proposal. And so that has carried me quite a ways relative to systems since then. Uh, maybe a Quick footnote back to John relative to the trist akoff division in the center. And when uh, I think once I and a friend took uh, Akoff's purposeful systems in and asked Eric, what do you think of this? How come you're not part of this? And he said that I suggested if they would include purposeful systems, I would join them. And <laughs> And then we laughed and left his room. <laughs> so Eric distinctly was not part of that book. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, Johnny, do you have any comments on uh, on the beginnings of um, this book with Emery? Well, uh, not specifically in this, but a couple of things that you alluded to, I mean, mentioned, you know, equifinality was, wasn't one that you talked about. Yeah, uh, there's, there's more of that coming. That, there's more of that coming. So we're not quite there yet, but yes, you can go but, ahead. But, but basically, uh, you know, um, the way I understood that, first of all, a lot of these concepts came from physics, if I'm not mistaken, right? right. Because that was the whole idea of general systems theory, that don't create these borders between different disciplines and use whatever you think is going to be helpful in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But um, 
you know, equifinality, the way I understood and the way these folks were talking about in the program, it only applied to human beings or to living systems, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, 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 we'll get to that. Um, because okay, so it's a, it's a, an important, you know, distinction, isn't it? Because uh, with it, it's like they used to say that mm -hmm. a lot of people say that such and such organization, which I guess you know you could also say has reached its its limit. You could say that it has hit the bottom. And again, a lot of these folks they would say that that concept does not apply to social systems you know there's no bottom you understand it's it can get worse and worse and worse and worse and we have seen it we have seen it at the country levels that there are countries that they have we think they have hit the bottom but they go you know they become worse and worse and worse. Now, what was the other one? I, 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 I forgot, you have to remind me. What was the other concept that you talked about? Oh, uh, so we'll, we'll get into more depth, um, but mostly we're talking about holes and parts and holes at this point, uh, mm -hmm. because because the system theory, like we're still back in the 1940s. <laughs> we haven't gotten, we haven't made progress yet. No, but it's, it's, it's they are such important concepts, aren't they? I mean, totally applicable in this, you know, day and age. I mean, you know, we're not going to talk about these things tonight, but, you know, one of the things that systems thinking teaches you is counterintuitive behavior, right? Hmm. Yeah, that's not really in the book, so I'd let you take it for <laughs> No, I know, but it's it's just I'm sorry, my mind works, you know, I'm I'm more into gestalt rather than right, you know, dividing the subject into smaller pieces. Yeah. When, well just just talking about gestalt, this is one of the things that um I find in the book is is the idea of gestalt um is is pretty major. The idea of holes here is major. Yeah, I mean, when I look at your face, right? Isn't that what gestalt means? I see this hole, which is unique to you. I don't look at your, you know, nose separately, your eyes, your eyebrows, or whatever. Okay, we in in the chat we have a question from Martin on equifinality, but I'm going to hold on to that one um, and come back to that one because that's that's in the next section. And let me cover some more stuff then. Um, so let me go back to screen share. Um, and step through this again. Okay. Um, so properties of open systems. Okay, so now one of the distinctions we have here um, is, is between, and there's a lot of discussion here about open systems and closed systems. And it, it, it's, um, Kind of historical, although, and and people in the audience will have to tell have to tell tell me whether you need more reinforcement about whether open because the assumption now is that open systems are usually like the presumption as opposed to a closed system thinking. Um, but uh, the the von Bertalanffy, I'm going to go into a little bit um, and classic paper he says and and discuss that a little bit. Uh, the Kramansky paper adds on to that a little bit. Uh, if you want more on living systems, he actually refers to James Greer Miller living systems. That's Miller 1965, uh, general systems approach. Uh, talks about Gerd Sommerhoff, which is later in this book. And let's see. Back. Okay, so that's that's the introduction to this section. So I'm just going to go right into uh, 1938 Kohler open and closed systems. Um, and it talks about the idea of equilibrium and machines and in effect, how you would think about these in terms of systems differently. 
And so physical systems transform themselves and they follow the second law of thermodynamics. So we have the idea of tying back to physics um, and equilibrium theory of organic regulation has dynamic direction. Second law applies to the organism, uh, balance vectors. So there's multiple things happening here. Um, okay, what is an organism? Uh, velocities in the tissue, so talking about movement. There's a reference now, uh, and this now we're leading up to what Johnny talked about, um, canon and, and equilibrium. Um, and the idea that as opposed to using the term equilibrium, you talk about homeostasis, uh, their steady states are preserved or reestablished in the organized organism. Uh, and it's not, it, it does not imply something set or immobile. So you might have uh, a physical, um, a physical entity, uh, water, sorts of things. Like you see water moving, it reaches its level, you might call that equilibrium. But if you're talking about a living system, you should probably use the word homeostasis instead. Um, can we use stuff from equilibrium? Um, now we start going expanding it. A flame is not a closed system. It can, however, be considered part of a larger system. You look at the behavior. General systems of an organism is not a closed system. It's part of a larger system. Difference between a flame and an organism. The organism itself normally contains great reserves of food in the wide sense the world is stored, for instance, in the liver. Um, so this is now more medical and less psychological when describing systems, and it gets into the organicism of the of the system. Um, let's see, okay, so that's the first one. That's 1938. So we're going to 1950. This is actually a summary. So uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, the father of uh, general systems theory, um, and he. This is a more technical paper. Um, so a system is closed if no material enters or leaves it. It's open as import and export. Living systems are open systems. Um, now he starts looking into chemistry. Um, and uh, that we moved up from physics into chemistry. Uh, he doesn't use the word biochemistry explicitly. He does use the word chemistry, though. And so he's looking for the generalizations of things that you could do across physics and physical chemistry. Um, and then uh, idea of dynamic equilibrium. And he says he's been working on this since 1932. 1950 is actually quite late for, for uh, von Bertalanffy. This is one of the later publications. So um, thermodynamics, still have a second law of thermodynamics applying in biology, uh, open systems, characteristics of open systems, second law of thermodynamics, uh, on time. Chemical equilibria are irreversible. So you have reversible versus irreversible. Um, energy for synthesis, uh, synthesis versus analysis, synthesis putting things together and I'll take things apart. And this is when we get into equifinality. Okay, equifinality. In most physical systems, the final state is determined by the initial conditions. And so this is a physical view of the world, but he's saying that vital phenomena show a different behavior. And so um, this would be social systems, but it, it also the possibility of biological systems. Um, it's getting sticky on the definitions here. Uh, closed systems cannot behave equifinally. Thermodynamics of open systems. Okay. Uh, and we're gonna get into entropy and all that sort of stuff, which is a whole nother ball of wax that I don't want to do. Prigozhin, um, thermodynamics, irreversible processes, entry must increase, biological applications. Okay, so now he's trying to use thermodynamics and figure out how thermodynamics works with uh, biology. And he refers to Reshevsky's cell modeling. Uh, Reshevsky was a precursor for Robert Rosen. Uh, in August, we we're actually supposed to have Judith Rosen come visit us in person uh, in System Thinking Ontario. So we'll see if we, that happens. Uh, quantitative theory of growth this goes on for a while. Okay, so that's von Berta Lanfee, open and closed systems. Um, 
Cats and Con is actually social. This was a, a, a textbook that came out you know, pretty well. Social Psychology of Organizations. It's an early book on open systems. Um, and let's see. So this is how they deal with organizations. How do we know they're dealing with an organization? What are its boundaries? What behavior belongs to the organization? What behavior lies within it, outside it? Who the individuals or actions are studied and what segment are the behavior to be included? So now we are actually full in, in 1966 into using uh, open systems theory with human organizations. Um, now, teleology, the study of ends and goal behavior, I'm finding very heavy in this book. Um, that's not an area I like. I understand it, um, that organizations need goals and purposes. Um, but uh, this one is really oriented heavily that way. Um, and Newtonian physics. Okay, common characters, open systems, imports energy, has throughput, has output, cycles of events. Negative entropy, which I think David Hawke is going to probably throw something at us about that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> information input, negative for the cloning process, uh, dynamic homeostasis, differentiation. Okay, equifinality. So there's, there, we're getting some of the same terms here, and they go on about that. Um, so uh, standard textbook, but uh, given that uh, Cats and Con was probably, um, I, it, it, I did my MBA in 82, and um, uh, between 1882, and this book was old then, but it was known at that point. So I would expect the 1970s um, that this sort of thinking would have been prevalent. Um, Ashby, Self-Regulation and Record of Variety. This was a really tough book, uh, tough read. For those of you who've thought about um, Ashby and thinking about requisite variety, I'll tell you that it's not what I thought it was. This is the first time I've read it. And uh, um, Fortunately, at the end, after I did all this transcription, um, he, 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 he has some summaries about, about it. Um, but the thing that surprised me about, uh, about the approach to this, and, and it, you really have to read this article, uh, the excerpts don't really help you, is that uh, when you're actually looking at it, here's a section, play and outcome. So the way that Ashby comes and looks at um, regulation and requisite variety, is through game theory. And so he talks about two players and in effect, the idea of requisite variety is that uh, if you're trying to beat your opponent, you need to have more variety than your opponent. And it's like, okay, I understand that now. I don't know how you do that if you're dealing with nature because I think nature always has more, um, more states than we can manage, but um, that's, that's my bias. Mm -hmm. um, but I found, I found this reading uh, quite difficult. I'll leave it for people who are really quite interested in that. Um, this Kreminsky article, uh, let's see, what, what's this about? Uh, okay, he's going, this is 1958, so he's trying to study organizations, oh, material systems. Um, this was a strange chapter because if we look at the title, um, he starts from cybernetics and then adds material back in. Uh, cybernetics is actually a science about information. And so then he looks at biology, trying to put that back in. It's kind of like, that seems a little backwards to me, but uh, if you come from a cybernetics approach, then um, you have to deal with the material in it. Um, so that's what I got out of this one. And then uh, Sommerhoff is the one, now this is really long. This goes from 147 up to page 200. So it's like 60 pages, 50 pages. And uh, I was uh, taking a lot of pain on this. Uh, I remember reading this um, a long time ago, not this section, but the idea about goal-directed behavior. Um, and the way I finally got through this, uh, he uses an example in the end about um, playing football. Uh, and the net was that, uh, in essence, when you're actually doing the analysis in, in goal-directed behavior, either you can go and chase the ball and kick it, or sometimes you wait for the ball to come to you, uh, which is a really strange conclusion and explanation of this. Um, black box football player, concept of adaptation, 
uh, learning. Uh, adaptation and learning, uh, I'll get I'll ask Johnny to speak about a lot because I remember in um, interactive planning, there was always a learning and adaptive systems. And so I, I my sense is my, might come from this, learn to discriminate self-regulation. Anyway, so I'm gonna stop and uh, go to David Hawk. And um, okay, I know you're gonna talk about entropy or anything else. What do you got to say, David? <laughs> uh, let me go backwards. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, relative to requisite variety mm. and uh, his take on that. Uh, a very interesting person I like reading, disagreed with him. Uh, that's a person called Anatole Rapoport. Mm. <clears throat> and Rapoport certainly knows more about game theory than Ashby ever did. And uh, probably the most classic article you could ever read about uh, uh, the take that um, that uh, Rappaport offers is to go back to a 2008 Scientific American issue. And that issue, the headline of it, and a special section at the beginning, as well as the editor's notes, <clears throat> had to do with uh, Rappaport's approach to game theory. And in essence, it essentially erases what Ashby said. Mm. but it makes it a very different animal. And uh, I think I've talked about it on here before, so I won't go into it. But in essence, <clears throat> uh, Scientific American ran Prisoner's Dilemma, oh. Prisoner's Dilemma to see what approach, what shall we say strategy wins. And that's how they announced it. <clears throat> and Rappaport demonstrated that the no strategy approach will win. The strategy approach will always lose. It was a fantastic piece of work. And that's why Scientific American loved that piece of work and made such a big deal of it in that issue. And I met uh, with Anatole a couple of times when I was working on something and I really liked his take on many such things. And so he would, uh, he would certainly argue with Ashby on much. But that's a footnote. <clears throat> Entropy, ah, that's five or six hours of introduction. So, uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> that, that was one of the problems I had with the systems people when I was in the systems program. Because in essence, they had filed away entropy someplace as uh, it's manageable. And they had come to accept negative entropy as something that is. And in fact, they assigned that as a characteristic to life. So as long as there's life, there's negative entropy. And then I would, I think I ask Eric, maybe Russ, that means you're immortal, right? You're not gonna die. No, 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 you confused me. But anyway, we had many discussions, but since that time, uh, I have found in the climate change issue, entropy is uh, extremely helpful to understand what's going on and why it's going on. And then recently I had a major set of arguments with a set of economists on the basis of inflation it has nothing to do with interest rates and why they're being silly creatures. All they're doing is making the rich richer, which maybe is their point, uh, but in essence, it has nothing to do with inflation. Entropy has to do with inflation. And so the driver of inflation is entropy. And that's why there's less food, food prices go up, et cetera. And the entire understanding of climate change will be based on entropy. And so I'm maybe three fourths of the way done with a book that goes into much detail on this and why in essence I call for the rethink of entropy. And I make great fun of negative entropy. And I and another person are writing an article on how essentially all management papers that deal with marketing assume negative entropy. And so I go through these articles and point out that the person believes in negative entropy, otherwise they wouldn't write the article. And the... <laughs> marketing people are really angry about the first draft of that paper 
But in essence, I use neg entropy as a way to explain many things, many people, and many stuff. And also why, at least from sitting here, I think humans aren't going to make it. I, I really believe that humans are not going to survive this. And a major reason is the very strong belief in negative entropy. And uh, that's, a, that's a tough one. But, and if you go into that, then David, you're right in the middle of open and closed systems. Um, and of course, that's where uh, Bertrand Lamphy came from because he didn't like some of the work that the thermodynamics people were doing. And so that was his reaction and response to thermodynamics. And I think he missed it there. And then of course, uh, many, many others have taken off. And so <clears throat> when I would go to the systems conferences, David, the annual meeting, I used to try and deliver a paper on entropy just to sort of tickle the group and see where they were at. And they got more angry each year. So I finally stopped and uh, I, I let it go. But uh, th there's very much to be said there in this book I'm now getting towards done with, I think goes into it. And one of my major supporters for many, many years was this uh, funny Georgescu erosion, which some of you may know of, some of you may not. But in essence, for me, he's the only economist that ever lived. I gained nothing from any other economist ever. And Georgescu erosion and his 1971 book, The Entropy Law and the Economic Process, is uh, quite a classic. But because of that book, the American economist makes sure made sure he could never get the Nobel Prize in economics. And while I was at the Stockholm School of Economics part-time for 20 years, his name would always come up and the Americans present would either swear or start yelling that he's not even an economist, let alone a Nobel Prize winner, and went on and on and on. But nonetheless, uh, entropy is a big deal in my current work relative to climate change. And I do believe our belief in negative entropy is a major reason we will not be able to deal with climate change. Thanks, David. Johnny, open systems on these chapters. Anything uh, ring a bell? Uh, yeah. Yeah. First, <laughs> first thing uh, uh, Dave was saying about Anatole Rappaport. Sorry, I have to give you a story uh, because when I was going uh, to places with Akoff, he always would be meeting with some of his, you know, friends and old uh, colleagues and all that. So one day we are in Toronto and he says that, let's go and have dinner with Anatole. He lived in Toronto. So I said, great, you know, I love to meet him. And besides that, I also, I'm half Russian, I speak Russian, so I can talk to him. So we go for dinner, and I swear to God, like for almost an hour and a half, Anatole spoke, I couldn't hear him. Uh, Dave, you, do you remember? He spoke very slowly, you know. And then I turned to, when, when the dinner was finished, I said to Russ, I said, Russ, please forgive me, but, you know, can you tell me what Anatole was talking about? And he said, no, I didn't hear him at all. <laughs> so, so anyways, um, you know, I like to talk about these characters because they were, you know, uh, fantastic people. The other one that I like to talk, which is also relevant to what we are talking is, uh, uh, let me backtrack. First of all, from what I learned, you know, uh, and especially from Rush, uh, we have uh, at least four different, he, he categorized systems into four categories. Remember, he had mechanistic, he had, um, 
you know, uh, animate systems. He had, uh, uh, you know, organizations and he had, um, uh, Jesus, I forgot. There, there is a fourth one. But the key thing was that in order to understand them uh, better, you had to know that, uh, you know, which are, are the parts purposeful or not, or, or, or how about the uh, whole? Is it purposeful or not purposeful? Because that would be a kind of a mindset you would require in order to go in and understand a lot of this stuff that, you know, we are talking about here. Like for instance, a lot of stuff that you talked about, they are, you know, they come from, and again, David, you correct me, they're, they're from organismic uh, model, correct? Yeah, so when at the early state, yes, it was organismic, which would be, um, purpose in the whole, but no purpose in the parts, correct? Correct. And, and uh, do you agree? I mean, that's, a, that's a, an important, you know, uh, distinction. And uh, if you don't understand that, you, you have a hard time to explaining things. Now, uh, Stafford Beer, which I was going to tell you that that was another incredible <laughs> dinner we had in Toronto again. But Stafford Beer model was organismic. And there was always, you know, like this back and forth between Akoff and Stafford Beer. Because Stafford Beer, uh, he was, you know, like, um, he, he was a good debater. You know, most of the British people are good debaters, right? But then Russ would say something, you know, like usually like, you know, like Stafford, this is nonsense. And that would get him, you know, like going crazy. And he, he told me that once he was debating Acuff at Oxford University or somewhere, he got so angry that he threw the chalk at him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyways, uh, you know, like homeostasis, and again, correct me because I don't remember all of this stuff. You talk about it, it reminds me. Uh, homeostasis is part of a viable system model, correct? Uh, it would be included, yes. Yeah, which, which basically, you know, he argues that's the uh, function that controls, right? the yes. performance of the, and then you've got the morphogenesis, which is your planning and the other thing, which is trying to create, uh, you know, the structure. Now, the, the, the other thing, you know, like David, the only thing in the world who, who, whose negativity is something that you strive for is entropy, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> that's the only thing that you like is the negative entropy. But while we have you, I mean, we can learn from each other. Could you, you know, like in layman's term, tell me what entropy is? Uh, in essence, it's the disintegration of things over time. They even dis disintegrate without use, but with use more rapidly. So, when humans are gonna make something, they go into the landscape, nature, context, and pick up the components to make this, which in essence tends to degrade the context in order to make this. But then certainly it requires energy for it to make sense and be useful. And so the use of the energy in essence degrades the energy. And so some people believe that you can recycle the energy or you can recycle the machine with the impression that it costs nothing. That if you're smart enough, you can simply recycle it, which of course you can't. That the second law of thermodynamics does not allow recycling. It just doesn't allow that, <clears throat> doesn't allow reuse of energy that was used. So in essence, it's a one-way trip. Uh, 
this was part of a, uh, a presentation that uh, another friend of mine and I gave at that 1980 conference I mentioned to David and to Kelly, where we uh, made a presentation on his book on Cosmos was coming out shortly. And my work on climate change had come out. And so we gave a joint presentation. And in essence, someone asked just what you ask. And then uh, he jived in and said, because he was quite a fan of what I was talking about. And he rose to the occasion and said, what would be really interesting is, you know, we all know the cosmos is in an entropic process. That entropy is probably the most important law of the universe. That it's the one that's there no matter what else we do. And Einstein said that also, that it's the one that will not be revisited. It simply is. And so Sagan went on and talked about the importance of that that determines what happens in the cosmos. <clears throat> and in essence, negative entropy is a joke, but people enjoy jokes, so why not? Let them have it. But then he went on to say, what you might want to think about is at the end of this entropic process, think for a moment, things stop and reverse. And the entire universe is neg entropy. And if you thought you were in trouble with entropy, just wait till you try to manage neg entropy on the way back. <laughs> and of course, the audience loved that. <clears throat> and I did too. And so he uh, got many people thinking but about David, uh, quickly, uh, how do you apply it to organizational design? What uh, should they do in order to, I suppose, a, a social them? organization? Yeah. To so in terms of using them. up the people, if nothing else. Say again in terms of using up the people, in terms of this great problem of leadership and what leadership does, and in some ways even worse, middle management. That for me, middle management is sort of the curse of death. And uh, uh, leadership, well, it's, it's a long argument, but it's one most famously I had in 2007 in China with the committee that selected the current leader of China where in essence, I argued about leadership often turns into leadership and it's no longer leadership. And so if you would give up Confucius and go back to Lao Tzu, you might have something to talk about. So when you select your next leader, think more of Lao Tzu than Confucian. So in essence, entropy deals with what happens in the organization as well as what it does. And so it's a process I consider quite uh, standard for everything. I, I neg entropy is funny and interesting and joking to talk about, but in essence, I can't find an example of neg entropy, and I sure have bought a lot of books about it. <laughs> the most famous is this man in uh, Israel that's written about ten books on entropy and neg entropy, and it's, I use it for humor. Let's, let's move on from the entropy question, <laughs> because David, there's actually a whole video on this uh, in the archive, people want to catch up on that one. Um, I want to give Martin the opportunity to, uh, to check in, because he had a question about equifinality, if you want to uh, come back in, Martin. Sure, sure. Thanks, David. So um, it was just because uh, John mentioned it, so it triggered me. And... Um, and it so, so happens it's something that I'm using in a paper or trying to use in a paper I'm writing at the moment. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so so if we go back to, to Fred Emery for a second, um, Fred Emery, uh, one of the other things that, uh, that he was responsible for was a, a method of causal path analysis, uh, which I'm trying to investigate. And so there is a... Um, there, there is a mechanism that he's invented to, to trace a path from predecessors to, to an outcome. And, um, and if we consider equifinality as the possibility that many paths exist to get to a certain outcome, um, it, it, it's always felt to me like that sort of invalidates 
the whole principle of a path model. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, either of uh, or, or, or anyone here on the on the call can help you know, educate me as to how one might use equifinality to determine uh, in a path model how to um, you know how to uh, get to an outcome from certain constructs and predictors. Johnny, would you like to uh, comment on that? I, I know uh, someone who might be able to help you better than myself. So if you could kindly, because he always talks about these things, if you could kindly uh, shoot a, an email or something with your question, I will share it and oh. see what he has to say might be of help to you. Yeah. Okay, John. I um I actually tried to connect with you on LinkedIn, so you'll see a link. Yeah, yeah, you can do it. But I'll you. find your email and uh, shoot you an email. Yeah, please. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Cheers. Okay. Thanks. Um, I see Peter Jones is making a few comments. Would you like to uh, like to uh, share something? Peter, oh, no, this, this is kind of like color commentary. I'm just being like a sports announcer here and going, you know, I remember, you know, Ran, uh, Randolph Glanville's, uh, um, you know, comments about the, about meeting notable systems thinkers and, and how he had to come up uh, through the ranks there. I mean, there really are, there really are notable differences though, in the kind of generations from you know, I said first generation systems thinkers um, that were kind of Stafford Beer, you know, that we might think of as first generation Stafford Beer, Christakis Warfield, Bubba Rome. They really are second generation, though. And and, and we don't know the first, I mean, from Bertolanffy through through Ashby and um, and, uh, you know, Norbert Wiener. And uh, you know, so if we we really look at from like 1935 to 1962 we're really that's really more first generation isn't it and i don't and i've never heard the same type of you know imperious ego filling room filling stories with them it seems like it was the you know maybe maybe it's really you know and this isn't a thing for you know a big thing but it would be interesting to hear a an impression on this because it is something that that I've noticed as well being whatever generation I am uh, I was like not directly um second from second generation or whatever from Christakis I studied with his I mean I got to you know he mentored me but I studied directly with his <laughs> seconds that were older than me so there is this kind of, you know, staging of what you're expected to do and follow when you take on a mentor and you learn this, these areas. And, um, you know, he's gent he's pretty gentle now, but, you know, he would fill a room. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe David and Johnny can tell us more about the visitors um, that, that came in through the, uh, the program. Yeah. David? Yeah, uh, David, you go ahead. Uh, you mean the, the, yeah, the ones I sort of already mentioned, but <clears throat> uh, Rappaport uh, was a great visitor, and yes, yes, there was that speaking problem, but uh, students were quite good at tickling him and getting him to uh, become either more upset or something, and clearer and harsher. Uh, as I've often told David, that. Uh, we spent some time with uh, Fred Embry, and as students, we noticed uh, he became more interesting and more understandable the more he drank. Yeah. And we went out drinking for a night. He was fantastic to go out drinking with, that he went beyond the limits of what he would write. And we really appreciated him doing that. So that was uh, quite good. and. Trist, I think, was this, the opposite of Emery, that uh, very much a gentleman, very kind, very nice. But then one night at a Stockholm bar, he finally had enough 
And he started hollering at me on how really, really bad I was and really, really hopeless. <laughs> he never did that again. He never did that before. But with three or four beers, he became much more transparent. Whereas Emery uh, became much more interesting with three beers. And so uh, Stafford Beer, I don't know. He was just sort of a big man that he liked you to think of him as a big man and sort of pissed off Acoff a lot. And, uh, and Russ sort of couldn't take it. Uh, Churchman, I liked a lot. And it was very easy to see why he was the mentor of Acoff. Uh, they certainly weren't the same. But uh, yeah, as I've mentioned to other people, it's worth getting hold of a copy of Acoff's dissertation, Methods of Inquiry, which he wrote with Churchman. And after that, uh, Penn mm -hmm. passed a law that no longer can a supervisor write a dissertation with the student. That is against all academic sense in the world. And they made a big deal of it, which Churchman enjoyed a lot. But uh, Methods of Inquiry is a great combination of those two, probably with Churchman more of the leader than Akoff. Oh, and that's so a good the, reference. Yeah, the personalities sure. were quite important there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I guess you, most of you have never heard of uh, Bird Whistle, have you? Ray Bird Whistle? No. Oh. Okay. Yeah. He and Irving Goffman. You've heard of Goffman, right? Yeah. Okay. Those two, since they were just across the street in another building, would come visit on occasion and were quite interesting. And now what I find particularly interesting about Bird Whistle is he had a model of human communication without words. And finally, people sort of laid him to rest, not knowing what that meant. Well, funny enough, Apple is now starting a brand new, very secretive R&D project for a new uh, artificial intelligence system based on Bird Whistle's ideas. And I only know wow. it because my daughter is one of the six people they hired to work on it. But I'm very excited about what they're going to try and do to overcome Microsoft and to try and get closer to people dealing with the truth or at least accepting the truth, which in most AI humans just exaggerate the lies. And so Bird Whistle and uh, Goffman were both quite nice additions a uh, very anti-Wharton School of Business, which was nice too. And Acoff tend to appreciate that. Uh, Trist also. And then there are various other people, I don't remember their names, but they were great. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, well, that's enough for those. Dr. Hey. for Johnny, though, if I could ask. Uh. Yeah, um, the ones that I really no, I, I mean about your influence in design, design thinking, because you know you you had a a great early article with your students in I Triple S uh, that was influential in our development of systemic design in the design community. You know, it was around the same I, time I, 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 that the, we were the, we were writing. No, the the paper that um, I think by now has been downloaded more than 100,000 times is the one that we argue for integration of systems thinking with design thinking. And uh, for some reason, you know, people like it. And I get uh, invitations, you know, to talk about it and things like that. But uh, let me go back uh, for a moment, you know, you were asking that some of the visitors to the program, the ones that I really, really liked very much. One was uh, uh, Sean from MIT. I forgot his first name. I'm getting to a place where I start forgetting names, but he was terrific. You know, uh, Chris Argyris, right? 
everybody is familiar with Chris Argyris. Mm -hmm. So he would be another, um, Ross had a good relationship with Peter Senge. I saw somebody, uh, you know, just mentioned, you know, his name. Um, uh, Sh Shine was another one. Ed, was it Ed Shine? Ed Shine, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, that, so, that, so, uh -huh. so, Johnny, since you, since you brought up Ed Shine and uh, also um, uh, sure. Chris Ardress, yeah. Um, can you, can you talk about uh, about Russ's uh, views on learning and adaptation? I think the only, you know, um, it, it's interesting that you're asking because that's my favorite topic. I think Russ's contribution there is just enormous. Uh, look, um, I think both of them, they kind of agreed on the definition okay, of uh, learning, which was, uh, what was it? Detection and correction of errors. They both use the same uh, definition. Now, Eikhoff though, he, as you know, developed a complete system because let me backtrack, Eikhoff from what I understood, his whole preoccupation in life was try to tackle these uh, intractable, what he called intractable messes, intractable problems, especially intractable problems. And his whole argument was that, um, you know, when you engage in planning and if you're not able to predict and prepare for the future, you better to create that future for yourself, design, correct? That was his you know, whole argument. But then people would say that, but Russ, let's say that if we design something today, we know for a fact that things are gonna change within a very short period of time in our environment. What do we do? He would say that you, um, you know, design it now, but endow that design with the learning and adaptation capability. And he, you know, offered the model. I'm sure that you are familiar, which starts with, uh, you know, tracking the decisions that have been made and then, uh, you know, um, see if the results, you know, expected versus, uh, actual, if there is a deviation, you know, you, I've written, by the way, several times, and I also presented a um, full-blown paper on that in Australia, believe it or not, in Deakin University. It's called uh, uh, Corporate Black Boxes. And so, he, you know, he, his approach was he, he agreed on the definition, but his approach was different. His approach was more socio-technical, so, you know, socio-cultural. Argyris was more psychological, which was, you know, Peter Senge, I'm afraid, took a lot of stuff from Argyris and presented in his work on learning organizations. So, you know, we don't have time right now, but I love to get a chance to present because this is unbelievable system. And I have been part of uh, implementation in many, many organizations, but we always started well, but our effort was stopped by the lawyers. Even, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to say that the same thing happened in, with Anheuser-Busch, that if you recall, I mean, Russ had free hand with Anheuser-Busch. He actually asked Jack Purnell, I went over there, started working, and everything was going well, and then boom, they stopped it. Why? I don't know because and and also with the pharmaceuticals because because the system calls for it's like aviation 
you know, you have a lot of things that get captured and goes into uh, the memory of the system, but the memory that you cannot change it. That's the whole thing about it. And I personally think for some reasons, the lawyers don't like that because you're going to have a record of uh, the decisions that have been made. That's, that, that's pretty interesting, Johnny, because the, uh, the, the, there are in, in the early in the section on open systems, there is discussions about mem not memory, but in effect, that sort of idea in a in a, a social system that is not uh, there in a in, in a physical system, um, so yeah. yeah. But you know, like, like the argument there is is that you can't have learning without you know memory. I mean, the whole essence of the thing is this: that you got to, like I said, detect the errors, okay, and correct. And many people have written about this and there are books, you know, I'm sure that David might remember one of the professors at the Wharton just recently wrote a book about it, you know, that, you know, everybody says that the first step in a learning organization is to create a learning culture, right? And learning culture means that you do not penalize people if they have made a mistake, but only you allow them to make the mistake once. You, you know, if they make it twice, the same mistake, then you, you know, fire them because they haven't learned anything. So it's, uh, and, and the other thing is this, that when you're working in organizations, which are extremely, you know, like, complex and huge, uh, you know, you and, and major decisions are made in different places of the organization. You need to have this system to, you know, basically capture those decisions. And you know that he actually created, well, we improved it. He calls it decision record, which starts with you know, what were your assumptions, what information you use, what you expected, you know, all of those things are easy to track, right? Yeah. But what is very difficult, and this is where, because as you know, my uh, favorite uh, subject in the world is aviation. And, uh, you know, I think they are just amazing. You know, aviation as a system is, amazing in learning and adaptation. I mean, look at the past three or four years, knock on wood. Okay, so so let me, I'm gonna do one quick last screen share because we're gonna to try to wrap up. Um, and uh, I just, I'm not even gonna go into the, into the uh, details. I'm just going to go into, just get, outline um, uh, the beginnings here. And so the part three is the environment of a system. So what happened was that in, in, in part two, we were talking about the properties of open systems and just about the system itself. In, this, in the environment of, of the system, and people can look at this, the key article is actually um, this article in 1965, the causal text of organizational yeah. environments. Um, but the reason these other articles are in here, so the, um, the Schutzenberger article is there to build on. Um, uh, the Ashby article, I didn't actually get much of, the Her Herbert Simon argument uh, is uh, primarily about um, uh, satisficing um, because uh, uh, a lot of the economics then was based off rational choice. Um, so um, I, I just got to jump to causal texture um, for a moment uh, because now we're looking outside of the um, system itself or looking at the organization. They start off with a case study uh, they talk about the four types of causal textures, which we've done multiple times. Um, and, uh, and then um, values, matrix organization. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it at that and I'll let uh, David comment and then uh, come back to Johnny and then we'll have open discussion. Uh, just a couple of comments on that, which I've <clears throat> made elsewhere to David. Uh, the causal texture, article is a 
very important, uh, except for them starting with uh, someplace in there with Bertha Lamphey and mentioning, I think on the first page, negative entropy, which I, I pretend I don't see each time I go through that article. But nonetheless, that article is quite, uh, quite an important piece. Uh, and as I've mentioned to some of you, that Trist had argued for a fifth type of environment, uh, whereas Emery didn't even want the fourth type of environment because he was concerned about what in the world would be a turbulent environment. But Trist had argued about beyond turbulence may well be a vortex environment and put together pieces on what it might be like. And I find that particularly interesting these days because certainly we are in a turbulent environment. There's very little question about that uh, unless uh, if you're a woke person, you notice it's a turbulent environment. Of course, if you're asleep and never look up, then you're fine, just keep on sleeping. And so that argument was quite interesting for me. And then within my work on my dissertation for Eric, uh, part of what was included had to do with this fifth type of environment and on how it might well be the future if we don't learn how to deal with environmental deterioration. And, uh, and Eric was very much with me on that. And in fact, Russ came on board relative to that thesis as well, that there is something beyond turbulence. So that article I think is golden and you should be quite familiar with it. Uh, maybe one quick link back to John, because I think John pointed out something quite important about the role of lawyers. And in my dissertation, the lawyer became the great enemy in that. Not that the lawyer created climate change, but the lawyer made sure that we would not resolve climate change and we would not resolve humans. And so we did a test of that. Uh, one of the firms that I was a senior advisor for for a long time, in this case, 15 years, uh, a foreign company that wanted to buy an American company in their industry. And so I took over due diligence and found a company they should buy, which was a $5 billion company. Uh, they were far beyond 5 billion, so don't worry about that. But I put down the conditions for them buying this company in New York, that they should have no lawyer involved in the process. That in essence, the two sides should work out a negotiation on how to arrive at a merger or acquisition. And I explained in detail why the two are very different and why in America, there's no such thing as a merger. It's always an acquisition. They just pretend it's a merger and that they should work with the other part and somehow absorb this $5 billion company. But no lawyer could be present until the final meeting and they were allowed to read the agreement. And if they had a problem with the agreement, they could either leave or explain their problem more clearly. <clears throat> and I use this by talking a lot about the dissertation I put together where the major problem of lawyers are hundred word sentences. And those sentences are a real giveaway on how incoherent the lawyer's mind is and why the process will be incoherent as well. Anyway, that merger was ranked by the Wall Street Journal as one of the greatest mergers in recent history in the US. And now the company that took over the $5 billion company uh, has grown from a uh, $200 billion a year company to a $300 billion a year company. And that acquisition was a major reason they were very successful. And so when they discussed that, they discussed things like the company being acquired, uh, their employees most wanted their CEO to be fired in public if possible. And so they emphasized the personalities and the personality problems. So if you could eliminate lawyers from a process, you're a step ahead. So you're quite right, John. I really appreciate that piece and it's terribly systemic. It, it's, it's a big one. Johnny, do you have more to, to talk about with uh, uh, the environment and um, uh, causal textures section? Okay. Your sound's off, Johnny. Mute. 
Yeah, I, I was just saying that we are, three of us are in the process of writing a book. <laughs> the only thing we have written is of course the title and it's gonna be uh, called uh, Navigating uh, Complexity and then Lessons Learned from Aviation. Now, we try to see where is it that we can connect the two concepts together, integrate, and believe it or not, and you know that, David, because you saw that I use your, you know, the paper that you had uh, posted, from them, the uh, you know uh, Tristan Emery, hmm. and and uh, it's environment, and believe it or not, we uh, looked at Dave Snowden's framework, right, which he starts with obvious, you know, uh, complicated, complex, and chaotic and disorder. If you think about it, it resembles the environment in which the pilot operates. Pilot goes through all these things. Now, the beauty of it is this, that like, like for instance, turbulence is equivalent to Snowden's complex environment. Because when you are in, especially when you are in clearer turbulence, you don't know what the hell is going on, which way it's going to hit you. Right. And then I interviewed seven pilots and all of them, I asked them, what do you do when you find yourself in such environment? And guess what? All seven said the same thing. We go for a ride. And that goes to what David was talking about. You know, when you are in a situation like that, go for a ride. You know, you cannot control. First of all, you cannot manage complexity, right? Anybody disagrees with that? How can you manage? It's the same as pilot. How can a pilot manage, a, you know, turbulence out there in the environment? So that, that paper has been extremely uh, helpful to us. And uh, uh, they... Okay. David. I'm, I'm just just on time we're going to try to wind up and we actually some people leaving so i want to invite roger to speak because he's been uh, in the background and ali dad if he doesn't have to take off too soon so uh, roger um, okay i hope you can hear me yes we can and uh, welcome martin uh, martin and i worked years and years ago in the uk so um, i just wanted to speak as i could find because um my sort of i have a really good opinion of rosakov now but at the time that my career was forming he was almost the the antichrist <laughs> and i and i tried to give you um a path and a timeline that got me interested in this and uh, i i think that's 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 a valuable ob ob observation particularly where we got to now because we're now talking about people like Dave Snowden. And again, Dave, Dave Snowden is somebody I've worked with like 20 years ago. Um, so, so there's a different story there. And I think it's important to recognize that, that, that different story. What I would say to go back to the original thesis, which was that book, the, the, the two very interesting things about that book that I found was the way that it changed from um, the first edition to the second edition. The, uh, the articles that were introduced and the articles that were dropped and the Ashby articles, because I thought when I read it um, all those years ago, the, the, uh, the Ashby articles were very, very good. And I think that's because my positioning was in hard OR, yeah? And it, it, they were the articles that, that spoke to me in terms of thinking about it as, 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 as control systems. And the interesting thing is the elements of the soft OR um, came, came across largely through the work of Peter Checkland um, because I, I think he was far more di, 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 digestible to real problems than, than, uh, than a lot of Rus, uh, Rosakoff's work. Now, I know every, every, everybody here are a Rosakoff's fan, and I'm a Rosakoff fan, but I don't want to rewrite history, and, and I'm trying to 
to explain how it was for me entering this industry in this space in the early 80s so that's 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 all i wanted to say and there's you know the the the, the kind of stories are very interesting and, and i always feel in these things like like the where's wally of, uh, of 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 each of these epochs of history but uh, that's it for, for another day thank you quick, Thanks, quick Roger. question quick question you said that you work with dave snowden how would you describe him as a person because he sounds and looks to me very you know eccentric and also he's uh, he, he acts as an agent provocateur he's basically against everybody including systems thinking um how would i describe it as, as uh, some somebody mentioned you you can get into trouble with things that you say um he is a showman um he is a uh narcissist narcissist and a plagiarist but um i hope this this kind of doesn't come out so he he deliberately acts in that way um in order to make you know to make a point and some of his stories are bits of history where i was where where i was um where's wally too so I, I know what actually happened, or, or my or my recollections of what happened vary with 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 his recollections of what happened. Roger, I don't want to take uh, more time. Is there any way we could connect? Because uh, I, I really want to know a few things about him. Because he, he, he although I love the framework, I, I just hate his commentary and uh, arrogance that he shows towards everybody. Well, he, he is he is very successful in popularizing what is an important field and dealing with 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 some real issues. But but I worked with 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 Max Boiseau and Max Boiseau was was a genius in this space. Um, and so and so did did he and, and 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 I think I think the contrast couldn't be um, thing. But uh, but I'll 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 I'll, uh, I'll uh, ping you something. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And uh, if, if Ali Dad is still on, I know he has to run to his job. Can you stay on to say hello? <laughs> Hi, everyone. What a privilege to be here. Um, I'm also from Iranian descent, John. So um, <laughs> it was wonderful to see the Tehran connection. Here. Yeah. So I had no idea that uh, Ross Aikoff and uh, Forrester were in t went to Tehran. So, oh, yes. Um, that's amazing. And uh, so I live in Australia and uh, with, with Martin and a few other folks, we've, um, we are um, looking at open system theory. Um, we did a course a few months ago with Marilyn Emery. She's still alive and very much active in, in Canberra, Australia. So we went up to Canberra and spent a week with her and um, learned a lot of lessons. And I think drinking runs in the family. So as soon as she drink few, a uh, glass of wine, the conversation becomes a lot more interesting. Um, so, no, it was just, I just wanted to say hi, and I will try to connect to everyone in this session. It was amazing hearing about our heroes of system thinking, and you folks have worked with them directly. And uh, John, your work around bringing complexity into system thinking and, and taking those approach and the connection to the environment is pretty interesting right. because... To me, the, the biggest thing about OST was um, consideration of the environment and the causal texture. And, um, and it was interesting that you made the connection to Gnevin and David Snowden's work. Anyway, um, I don't have anything to add to this uh, session, you know, just uh, at all, um, being at your presence. And David, I've been following your work a lot. Um, you've contributed a lot to the system thinking. Yeah. Um, and um, a community and, and you kind of collecting the information and sharing it and organizing it. That's, um, um, it's, it's a privilege. So we have a, a community, a, a meetup um, initially started in Australia, but now it's a bit of a global. So we have over uh, 40 countries, um, people from 40 countries. It's called Systems at Play. I shared the link. So it would be amazing if some of you folks uh, join and I will, try to connect with all of you and we can if if you would like we would it would be um, um really good if you can come and present and share your wisdom with the community as well thanks for the time david really appreciate it thanks
And so he gets the last word. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, we had it's a happy, it's a good time. We have to wind up. Um, and uh, but um, uh, I'm going to announce the next month's session. Uh, we've got, actually got planned. I just need to put it up. Uh, Gary Metcalf is actually at the ISSS meeting in uh, South Africa uh, and uh, presenting. And so we're going to get the presentation that uh, it's jointly between him and me on philosophizing and sciencing um, in systems. So um, everyone watch out for those announcements and we'll see you next month. Bye. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thanks, Thanks John. for joining us, John.